In the previous video, we spoke about the RNA interference mechanism, the RNAi mechanism and how it can be used to regulate gene expression or how it can be used to silence the expression of a specific gene. We ended the video by talking about the potential uses of RNA interference in agriculture, specifically in making plants resistant to pests. So that's what we're going to talk about in this video, specifically how scientists use this RNA interference mechanism to tackle a nematode infestation. Imagine being a farmer with healthy crop, only to see your plants being constantly destroyed by pesky nematodes. The major culprit, this nematode right here, Meloidogyne incognita. It's quite a mouthful for me as well to say. Let's just remember it as the root knot nematode. This nematode is a roundworm that causes knots or nodules to form in roots, which affects the plant's ability to absorb water. This is what the root gall looks like. It's called root gall because of these galls or nodules that form on the roots. Now, this nematode affects a wide variety of plants like tomato, tobacco, rubber, coffee, economically important plants because of which it was causing huge losses to farmers. And farmers were at a loss because they couldn't really easily get rid of this nematode infestation. It was not listening to the usual pesticides they were using. So scientists got involved and they decided to come up with a few different methods to tackle this infestation. And one such method was using the RNA interference mechanism. So how does that work? So if you remember from the previous video, RNA interference targets a specific target mRNA. So the risk complex that contains the antisense strand of the siRNA or miRNA. In this case, we're going to stick with siRNA because this is exogenous. It's synthetically being produced in the plant by genetic engineering. This siRNA has this antisense strand which is complementary to this target mRNA. So this complex is going to bind to this target mRNA and it's going to prevent translation from occurring. So how can we use this to make the plants resistant to nematode infestation? So the first thing the scientists did was to figure out which target mRNA they could use. So they figured out some crucial mRNA, some crucial proteins or genes without which the nematode could not survive. So the expression of this mRNA and the protein thereafter is very crucial for the survival of this nematode. And if RNA interference mechanism came in between and made sure translation did not occur, then the nematode would not survive. So that was the entire principle behind the RNA interference in pest control. So the first challenge for scientists was to figure out this target mRNA, this target gene that was crucial for the nematode's survival. Once that was done, there was another problem. So they have identified the target gene, the essential nematode gene, fine. But for RNA interference to be kicked off, it needs a double-stranded RNA molecule. So that this double-stranded RNA can be recognized by dicer and can be chopped into smaller bits of siRNA. So this double-stranded RNA needs to be made with the sense mRNA and the antisense mRNA. But here is the problem. When a gene is being transcribed, one strand acts as the coding strand and the other strand acts as the template strand. So only one of these strands is essentially being transcribed into mRNA. So scientists needed to figure out a way to make sure both these strands were transcribed into mRNA so that they would be complementary to each other and they would form the double-stranded RNA. Once they did that, once they isolated the genes for the sense mRNA and the antisense mRNA, they took that and used a cloning vector to clone the genes. So the most common cloning vector that is used in genetic engineering in the field of agriculture is the TI plasmid vector from agrobacterium. So that's what they did. They took the sense and the antisense genes basically and they cloned it in the TI plasmid. So here you have a TI plasmid that is cloned with the sense sequence and the antisense sequence. Once this was done, the next steps were pretty easy. The TI plasmid needs to be put inside its carrier organism, which in this case is agrobacterium. So the transformed agrobacterium cells are selected using selectable markers like antibiotic resistance and then they're grown along with plant cells in a laboratory. You see, the thing about plant cells is that they are totipotent, meaning these cells can give rise to all types of plant tissues. 
So the plant cells are grown along with these transformed agrobacterium vectors and the new plant that is formed from these plant cells would now express the genes for the formation of the dsRNA. So inside the plant cells, both the sense and the antisense mRNA is going to be produced and we would get a double-stranded RNA. Now this is where the RNA interference mechanism is going to kick off. So either of two things can happen here. One is the plant's RNAi mechanism can be activated and dicer will come and dice this dsRNA into siRNA or dicer would not be activated and it would still remain as dsRNA. Either of this is fine for us because here is where the plants are going to be ingested by nematodes. So we're going to make these plants be attacked by nematodes. Even if it does happen, it's fine because we're going to have the nematodes RNA interference mechanism also kick in later. So when the plants that now have the double stranded RNA are ingested by nematodes, either of two things can happen. One is the nematodes RNA interference mechanism will kick in and the nematodes dicer that's going to chop this dsRNA into siRNA. Fine, fantastic. We now essentially have the siRNAs. So here we have the siRNA inside the nematodes and now the siRNA is going to be recognized by the RNA induced silencing complex. It's going to be split into the sense and the antisense strand and the sense strand is eventually going to be degraded and we're going to be left with the antisense strand. The antisense strand will now target this specific nematode mRNA that we've been talking about earlier. It's going to target this mRNA that is for a very essential or a crucial protein for the survival of the nematode and this is going to come and bind to it because it's complementary to this target mRNA. And once this is done, once this risk complex comes and binds to this target mRNA, it's going to cut this mRNA into pieces. And when it cuts it into pieces, it means that no translation can happen. So this way, even if the plant is ingested by nematodes, then the nematodes cannot survive in the plant because it's going to have the antisense RNA containing this risk complex which is going to come and target this essential protein producing mRNA of the nematode and that's going to prevent translation from occurring. That's just going to kill the nematodes. So this is how scientists used RNA interference to specifically target this nematode species. This opens up a huge variety of possible uses of RNA interference in several fields like agriculture and medicine because this way we can target specific mRNAs for specific proteins. This way we can essentially silence the expression of specific genes tailor-made to suit our needs. So this means that virtually all parasitic infections can be prevented by cloning the essential genes. This also makes sure that only the parasitic genes are targeted, parasitic mRNAs are targeted and the host mRNA like the plant's mRNA are not targeted because we're selecting a specific target mRNA here. So this is how RNA interference is extremely useful in the field of genetic engineering.